Hello. Thank you for coming to my Imagine Digital talk. Uh, I was very glad to be asked to do a talk. Um, it's been a while since I've written one, so I might be a little bit rusty. Um, my name's Anya. Uh, I am going to be talking about basically things to remember while making 3D environments. So it's kind of advice on composition, color, lighting, texturing. Um, personally, I wear a variety of hats in my professional work. I am mostly a concept artist nowadays and I do 3D environment art as well. Um, so I'm going to be coming from the perspective of someone that works in a kind of broad range of things uh, on the concept and environment art side. Uh, so I started as a environment artist in 2016 uh, when I graduated university uh, at Creative Assembly. Uh, so that was doing some work for firstly Total War Warhammer 2 and then for Total War Three Kingdoms as well. Uh, so I was doing campaign map art for that. Uh, I'll show you some stuff on screen as I go. Um, since then, I've worked at various studios such as uh, Rare, uh, a company called Molasses Flood. I've done some freelance work for since working at Rare, which I still do. I, I've done mostly freelance work on the side. Uh, so for other companies such as Amazon Game Studios and Supercell and some other ones as well, I do a bit of indie on the side also. So here's just some examples of my work. Uh, I just do a bit of everything. Uh, so currently my jobs that I'm doing, apart from work at Rare as a concept artist, I do environment art, so I'm making props. Uh, I'm doing art direction, uh, some illustration work uh, and other concept art jobs as well. So in my workflow, uh, when I'm making 3D environments, I work between 2D and 3D quite fluidly uh, to, to create both paintings as well, actually. Um, so here's an example of some paintings that I've done. Uh, none of these got made into 3D dioramas, but they did start out as, uh, as 3D block outs. Uh, this image is the one that started out as a painting, like the ones I just showed, and ended up becoming 3D piece. So I'm going to go into detail today with this piece, uh, covering why I've made certain decisions with color and lighting. Um, I make a lot of creative decisions informed by both my 2D and 3D experience. So I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, what do I hope that you'll come away from this video with? A better understanding of the decisions, hopefully that go into making a visually pleasing 3D game art scene. Uh, so it goes beyond creating just well-executed assets. It, it's one thing to make good props and you therefore are probably a prop artist. It's another thing entirely to make a full visually pleasing environment, uh, which is taking into account, like I said, things like lighting and color. Um, it's almost fine arty kind of stuff that is being considered. So the baseline is when I'm creating 3D work, I'm not thinking about just creating individual prop pieces. I'm presenting them together as a scene um, from the very start. Nothing in the scene is an afterthought. I don't decide that I want to show off my texturing ability by making like a, I don't know, a cool clock tower, uh, which I then decide to present afterwards in a cooler setting. That setting is immediately decided that it's going to be a clock tower that's going to be on a hill with a waterfall and a bridge and so on. So I'm thinking about everything. Uh, so just as an example, I'll pull up my 3D scene. And I just want to show the individual props that I have here. Now they're, they're okay, like they're fine, but let's pull out these rocks and let's pull out a couple of pots into the sun. And if you look at them up close, they're very, very simple. These are not portfolio assets. These are not beautifully sculpted, perfect, immaculately textured things. If 
I set that to unlit. They're like, they're okay, but they're, they've just been very simply textured, uh, working from a curvature map as a base with color added and some highlights. But they're definitely not, I wouldn't get hired at uh, somewhere for the prop texturing ability from uh, assets such as that. So, always think of environments as full pieces of art, uh, kind of like a concept, I guess, a similar thing. It's a full congruous image. Everything has to sit well together. That means you've got to, like, at the start, consider basic art fundamentals. So they're listed now here, color, composition, lighting, uh, value. These are probably all things that you've been taught at school, like art school or whatever. Um, I think you probably get taught them at sort of GCSE if you're from the UK like me. Uh, shape and form uh, and also noise and rest, which is something I'm adding for the sake of 3D art. Um, I mean, it's very, it's still very important in traditional art, but it's probably got a different name. I don't actually know, but noise and rest is what I'm gonna call it. Now, I'm ruling out shape and form for now because, I mean, they're all very complicated topics, but shape and form is one that kind of you can run off on, on your own a little bit with it and you have to, there's a lot of sort of sketching and sort of shapes and stuff that I'd end up drawing. So I'm gonna leave that out for this. Um, I mean, likewise, I could probably do a several hour presentation on color and composition and so on, like on their own. But I'm gonna very briefly talk about all of these. Hopefully I can give some quick tips and tricks that help in the future uh, with before I run out of time, which time tends to bleed when you're talking about stuff like this. So now this scene that I've just shown you on screen was created from this concept. Um, the concept was built on a 3D uh, base, like I said, for the previous paintings that I'd shown earlier. Um, and then the actual 3D scene itself was based upon the 3D block out that I did. So here is the, the two side by side, so you can see what I mean. They're both very similar. They both almost match word for word, side by side. The big thing that I changed was the trees. Um, and there's been some color modifications as well. The lighting scheme remains exactly the same. Well, mostly the same. They're all things that I kind of change as I go, but often I end up just coming back to what I did in the concept anyway. So color, like I said, I'm making decisions throughout the piece. Um, but the fundamental decisions that I'm making that build the foundations of these pieces are often made at the very beginning in the concepting stage, or at the very least in sort of blocking out all the early stages of lighting a scene. So mostly that will be lighting and color are the main ones that are sort of the, the pivotal um, points to create interesting mood. So I'll talk a bit about colour first. So, lots of colour swatches. I don't tend to use particular colour schemes when I'm making work. I do tend to feel it out, so it can be difficult for me sometimes to talk about colour, especially from a sort of art schooly perspective of colour wheels and um, different colour schemes, like complementary colour scheme. Um, tetradic and so on. Um, but if you look at this piece, I have felt my way towards what I would say is probably mostly a complementary colour scheme. You could call it probably a whole range of uh, colour schemes if you wanted to dive into it, like uh, complementary uh, tetradic, I think I have pulled up literally a colour wheel before and looked at it and I've been like, yep, that's tetradic, which is where it's uh, four corners of the colour wheel. Um, split complementary as well, uh, which is where you have one colour at the bottom of the colour wheel and then two opposite it. Uh, but for the sake of simplicity, I would say that this is a complementary colour scheme. That is, I have chosen the colour red, 
which let's say it's at one side of the, the uh, color wheel and I've chosen green which is opposite on the color wheel. So in this case the foliage is all very green, uh, maybe some shades of yellow but mostly green and the building is red with some orange thrown in there. Now in addition to those two primary colors or well those two main colors I don't literally mean primary colors there's also some more neutral colors which I use for the supporting assets. They are colors that I don't want to stand out or take away from the show, but I still want them to be more than just gray. So I've chosen a kind of brownie color. It might have a little hint of purple. I might blend in some green if it's next to some foliage. And then I've got a more sort of purpley purple. I'm using that for a lot for things like tiles on the floor and also for areas of rock. Um, so these are supporting areas that I don't want to stand out too much. I also have areas of white, not pure white, but kind of grayish white. And they're for areas that I want to just, they kind of stand out. And I always find that white plays off of other colors nicely. Um, but they're just areas that I don't want to stand out too much. Not everything has to have a color. You can have stuff in white and gray. And I wouldn't say pure black, but areas of black also. So with these colors, I do actually blend quite a lot, which means that my initial complementary color scheme goes a little bit out the window uh, and it almost becomes just an entire rainbow of colors. But I like to say it's a controlled rainbow of colors, uh, mostly red and green with orange and yellow blended between. And to do this, I actually I'm, I'm creating gradients when I do this so that not everything is just an isolated pool of color, but everything blends between one another. So if you look at this scene, um, it goes, the main areas go from blue water to kind of bluey green grass underneath the water. You can see it here with the edges of the grass to a yellowy green, to a yellow, to an orangey yellow, to an orange, and finally to almost pure red on the building. And then I've got areas of neutral, to break that up with white and purple. And like I said, there's this kind of brownie color as well, which I blended into some green. And again, even things like rocks, I have blended in this area of sort of greeny, greeny brown to create gradients up everything I can. Even this white building in the middle, I've put a darker color at the bottom, even though it's super subtle and you can't really see it. So everything has a gradient on it and gradients are really important. My last bit of advice about colors, um, I've already mentioned it, is just avoid black. Blending black into colors makes stuff really muddy. It can kind of flatten out all your colors. So use more like shades of dark blue or purple where you can. Um, and that includes in your neutrals. So avoid black. And I don't tend to use bright white either, but it's not such a big deal. Uh, moving on swiftly to composition. Um, now this scene, the first thing that it had, I considered when I was building this was making the scene a, a kind of diamond shape. There's no hard edges or anything popping out that's jarring. It's all within this per almost perfect diamond shape, except for the trees, I suppose. Um, so the point of making the scene a uh, kind of diamond shape is to make sure that all of the leading lines draw you into the scene. Uh, there's nothing, like I said, that points particularly out of the scene. That would be stuff pointing out at like a 90 degree angle to say the left or right that would just completely throw you out of the scene. Your eyes would come off the edge and then fall out of the scene. So uh, everything is quite swooping. It kind of pulls you in and around the scene. Uh, the big one that I wanted people to uh, be drawn towards is the, the line in the center of the scene that starts in the water works its way up the stairs as if you're walking up the stairs, uh, the large black and white stairs that is. And then it guides you up the, the central orange stairway to a fountain that's behind. So like if you rotate around the scene, which I can actually do. So you're drawn up and into this fountain area. So then you can rotate around the scene and you're wondering what's behind here. And there is a uh, fountain and the water just flows back down this waterfall and into the scene. 
so I have made sure to consider the back of the scene. Um, this is super important for full environments where you're trying to make something that people can uh, walk around. You want people to be drawn into areas. You don't want it to feel like you've just considered that one pretty picture, that money shot, and then just left it. Um, with dioramas, it's kind of, I suppose, easier in some ways because it's obviously a much smaller scene and you don't need to consider multiple angles that someone could be uh, facing one way and not look behind them because there's just one direction that someone needs to look at. But in another sense, it can be more difficult with dioramas because you need to come up with creative ways that you can do in a small space. So it's kind of difficult both ways. Um, so using contrasts between symmetry and asymmetry can be quite useful uh, for creating interesting scenes. Like I said, this scene's a diamond shape, so overall it's quite symmetrical. But I've added in elements of asymmetry using things like the trees, uh, rocks. I've also set off-centered the building, so I've rotated it a little bit so that the stairs aren't just directly straight ahead of you. Another important thing to consider, like I said, is lighting. It's very important to make a, light, a scene emotive and welcoming or, you know, scary or whatever you want. Lighting is probably the bread and butter of trying to get that done. So, for me, lighting makes the difference between a good environment and a great environment. You have to put a lot of thought into it. I've seen a lot of really good environments that have slightly lacking lighting. And then we go in and we add more lights or just brighten lights up even a little bit. People tend to be quite subtle with the lighting. Brighten up the lights and immediately the scene feels more real, feels like you're in it. And immediately an environment feels more interesting. My lighting setup is actually really, really simple. Uh, this is in Unreal Engine. I use a skylight, which is usually tinted blue, and a warmer light for the directional light, which is the sun. Um, the sun doesn't emit warm light, and the sky isn't, uh, shadows aren't really sort of super blue naturally. There isn't a blue light in the sky, but the blue comes from the color of the sky, uh, and the warmth uh, comes from an optical illusion because shadows are cool the light feels warmer. Following on from my point about uh, using the color black, the same goes for shadows. Try to avoid having black shadows. The skylight in this particular instance is really, really important to make the shadows feel lively so that they're not just black and depressing and it can be too contrasty if you have black shadows. So brighten up those shadows. Don't be afraid to add in some light. I also use point lights to add accents of uh, color or pops of brightness to draw the eye around certain points. So in this particular instance, I wanted to brighten up under the archways underneath the scene. So that's why there's like a, almost an, a red under light. Uh, you can see it particularly on the left hand archway. It's because there's point lights under there uh, and the same for underneath the main archway of the building. Similarly related to lighting is value. Um, lighting very much influences values. So if we take a look here at the scene in black and white, um, you can see that I have, well, it's not super clear, but you would see if there was a side by side comparison that I've used fake shadows with invisible trees to actually darken the edges of the diorama. Um, so this is a trick used to guide the viewer's eyes so that they don't uh, sort of come off the edge of the scene, like I was talking about with having uh, things pointing out of the scene. Again, I'm not having light areas at the edge of the scene. It's all very in shadow. And if I pull up Unreal Engine and I hit G, there are my hidden trees. So these are all casting shadows at the edge of the scene. So if I hit G, and if I delete those, there we go. You can see it's totally different. So that's how important it is to really consider your lights and shadows. The scene looks totally different. So using those trees, I have, like I said, created areas of light. Areas that I want the viewer to look are lighter and areas that the viewer does not need to linger on are darker. Areas that are important 
are of the highest contrast. So you can see I have this dark area between the archway, which is black, and that is so that you can see that there is this black contrasting area against an area around it which is much brighter. Uh, because of that, the eye is immediately drawn to that area where there is black and white right next to each other. Uh, the same goes for the bell on the building. So the area that is in the pool of light, which is like the main area in the center where all the checkerboard uh, tiles are, and then combined with the really high contrast area under the archway, means that that is the focal point and you are drawn there. On the topic of noise, um, contrasting values and, uh, I mean, to be honest, everything can be used in combination with various factors. Uh, noise being another tool in your arsenal to draw the viewer around the scene. It's kind of hard to describe what noise is, but I guess it's it's like the amount of contrasty detail in an area. So you've, you've all seen the sort of Photoshop noise filter. It's just this noisy texture. Um, so noise is kind of a similar deal here. It's the amount of contrasty details side by side. Um, in this particular example of a scene, I've kept my textures relatively noise free. There isn't tons of detail. There isn't any black and white uh, nearby each other. Everything's like a very neutral, neutral uh, value. And so it all kind of fades into one another and it creates this soft feel. Instead, I've opted to get my noise from mesh detail. So I've used actual meshes to create the detailing that, I'm, uh, that I want. Uh, so that's things like the lily pads and the ivy. It's the actual mesh that's the detail there. Playing areas of noise against areas of rest, so areas with very little sort of noise and contrastiness going on, uh, is another important way to lead the viewer. So for example, in a mostly noisy scene, the viewer will be drawn to areas that are clean and free of noise. Uh, on the other hand, in a noise-free scene, something that's very clean, the eye will be drawn to areas that are more contrasty and noisy. So it's about how you contrast those against each other. Uh, in this particular instance, I've used pattern to draw attention. The pattern creates noise. Um, whereas on things like the stairs, I've used much the orange stairs that is. I've used much softer um, texturing. So there's still a bit of detail and a bit of noise in there, but it's kind of softer. And so your eyes can rest there. Uh, areas that are out of the focal point, such as underneath the diorama, the arches underneath uh, and the top of the archway, the textures themselves are mostly very clean and plain. So that is somewhere that I'm not particularly bothered about someone looking. I've still made them nice so that they're not, you know, this ugly bit in the corner of the scene, but they're mostly quite clean and soft textures, just so you can quickly look at it and then you can move on to the rest of the scene, which is the really noisy part in the middle with the things like the um, the tiles and the really contrasty uh, bits with the through the archway uh, and meshes like the bell at the top of the tower and the... Um, the fountain as well creates a kind of visual noise because it's quite a detailed mesh um, in the middle of this very plain clean archway. So that was a super quick rundown of stuff that I feel is important when creating environments. Um, there's some very important aspects that you need to bear in mind uh, that come about from what I've just talked about. Um, an environment needs to be very, very clear. Uh, this in particular uh, is for sort of full environments, I guess. Um, it's, I think it's equally important to con consider these things for full environments and for dioramas, but the point is that you have to make stuff extremely clear to whoever is playing your game. Where do you want the viewer to look? What path should they follow? Uh, how do you want them to feel? Everything has to be extremely clear. You have to really spoon feed your viewer. So if you want the viewer to feel happy, you need to really make that sun super bright and you have to make the colors bright and happy. If you want stuff to be kind of miserable, dark, make it rain, 
put in loads of fog, make the colors depressing. It needs to be extremely clear. So you need to go straight in from the very beginning of your scene at the concepting stage and just hammer that home super hard. Um, and one of the best ways to show these, uh, well, to really hammer the point home, I guess, is to make very, very careful decisions about contrast. I always talk about all these points like lighting, composition, color, and every single one has some aspect of contrasting one thing against another. Uh, for example, um, contrasting colors, contrasting areas of saturation and desaturation against each other, um, like colors, I mean, uh, contrasting areas of dark and light, um, like actually in the textures, also contrasting areas of light and shadow using lighting, noisy areas, resty area, uh, restful areas. Um, in the case of a game, it might be contrasting um, areas of like playable area versus non-playable area and having them very different so the player knows which is which. Um, it could be something as simple as the contrast in the length of grass between two areas. So um, long grass shows that it's not playable, short grass shows that it is playable. Um, and I know I didn't really talk about shape or form here, but also sh contrast in shape language. Uh, so in the instance of this diorama, it might be the natural shapes of foliage versus hard man-made shapes or like weird quirky shapes like the top of that building. You can get super deep into it and it'll, you could go on forever. Um, but yeah, it's something that I've come to realize over time is that the, the big thing that I have found um, for creating compelling environments is to really consider contrast. Uh, use contrast to make stuff super clear. Um, so yeah, I guess that kind of covers it. Just make sure that you think artistically as you create your environments um, from the very beginning. Don't just make a, a pretty building and plonk it on a disc because it might be a really good building, but you're taking away so much from the viewer by just putting it on a disc and making an interesting scene for it to be in from the beginning is extremely helpful for finding jobs. Um, I've only ever used dioramas to get jobs and I've worked on a lot of different things like open world games, top down games, isometric games. And they were all drawn to my diorama work to start with. So it's okay to make little dioramas. So thank you for getting to the end of this slightly rambly talk. Um, if you're interested in more in-depth covers of stuff like lighting and color, uh, I do have a YouTube channel, which is somewhat neglected, but I hope to continue a series that I do have on there. Um, so take a look and uh, I'm on Twitter as well. You're more than welcome to get in touch if you want feedback or just to show me something. Um, I do usually offer mentorships, but I'm super busy at the moment, so I'm not doing that right now. Uh, but feel free to just get in touch. I can send paint overs uh, at me in the Imagine Digital server if you want to. Uh, and I'm happy to just talk about cool environments because that's all I do. <laughs> Thank you so much.